Which one of the following quantities is the tendency of an object to resist a change to its state of motion? That is inertia, right? So the answer to 1.1 is A. And then 1.2, a ball is dropped from rest at a height above a concrete floor. The ball strikes the floor and bounces vertically up and down on the same spot on the floor. The velocity time graph for the bouncing ball is shown below with point P, Q, R, and S representing different times during the motion. Let's ignore the effects of a friction. At what time does the ball reach its maximum height after the first upward bounce? Right, so let's go ahead and analyze our velocity time graph. Right, so at this point here, at the origin, that's t is equal to zero, right? At maximum height when it is being dropped, the velocity is zero when a ball is being dropped. And then it goes on, uh, down and strikes the ground uh, with some V max, right? So at this point, this is where the uh, ball strikes the ground. And then from striking the ground, it's definitely going to bounce and then reaches some maximum height, right? Before going down again for the next bounce. So we're looking for the maximum height after striking the ground once, right? The maximum height is right here at point Q. Why are we saying that the maximum height is right there at point Q? That is because we know that the velocity at maximum height is equal to zero meters per second, right? So Q is the maximum height after uh, the first bounce. And then S would be the maximum height after the second bounds right that is um 1.2 so the answer here is supposed to be b at what time does the ball reach its maximum height out of the first upward bounce at t is equals to q right and then 1.3 this is quite an interesting one two blocks p and q of masses m1 and m2 respectively are held at rest on a frictionless horizontal floor with the compressed spring between them as shown below. And then um, when the blocks are released and the spring drops to the floor, block Q moves to the right with a velocity V. Right, which one of the following represents the momentum of block P after the blocks are released? Right, so I want you to think about something. I want you to think about the conservation of linear momentum, right? Before the spring was released, the total momentum was zero right so after it is released the total momentum should also be zero right so uh, after it was released the momentum of q right the momentum of q will be equals to m2 multiplied by v that's what we have right and then what about the momentum of p what about the momentum of p right uh, a few people would think that oh, okay uh, the velocity of p should be half the velocity of q because p is two times q but then it looks like p is bigger than q but then you're not told you cannot just conclude that um, uh, p is uh, larger than q right i mean what if the density is different and actually q is uh, way more than p right uh, such things can happen. So you cannot conclude that P is greater than Q or Q is less than P and so on by just looking at them. Because what about density? If the momentum of Q is 3 units to the left, then we would expect the momentum of P to be 3 units to the right. Because when we add those two, we're going to get a total momentum of 0, which is what we're looking for, right? Uh, I'm saying that to say that if the momentum of Q is m2 multiplied by v to the right then the momentum of p is also m2 multiplied by v but this time to the left right the momentum need to be the same the same magnitude but in opposite directions so that the linear momentum is conserved and that is option d so the answer to 1.3 we have uh we have d right and then uh 1.4 1.4 so in 1.4, the question is saying that uh, the magnitude of the gravitational force that spheres X and Y exert on each other is F. Uh, the mass of sphere X is now doubled, while the mass of sphere Y and the distance between the centers remain the same. Which one of the following combinations is correct for the magnitude of the forces that the spheres exert on each other? Right, so let's say F1 is equal to G, M1, 
m2 divided by r squared so that is f1 and then now to calculate f2 or the new force we need to double the mass of m1 right let's take m1 as the mass of x and m2 as the mass of y if we do that we're gonna get g 2 m1 m2 divided by r squared so f2 will be 2 g m1 m2 divided by r squared this will be equals to but we know that g m1 m2 divided by r squared is f1 right so we have 2 f right to f1 and that is uh option option d option d so for 1.4 the answer is d why is it not c or b uh for c and b you can see that we have uh, 2f here and here we have f and then here we have f here we have 2f right we know that the force that m1 is exiting on m2 is the same force that m2 is exiting on m1 right so we need to have 2f for the force that x exists on y and 2f for the force that y exists on x right so the answer here is d uh moving to 1.5 so 1.5 a hot air balloon is moving vertically downwards at a constant speed assume that the mass of the hot air balloon remains constant right which one of the following physical quantities associated with the hot air balloon changes during the motion the first option is weight right we know that the weight is the mass multiplied by gravity so that never changes unless you change from one planet to another right but then if a old air balloon is just going down a constant velocity the weight is not going to change right and then so a is not correct and then b momentum p is equal to mass multiplied by velocity the mass remains the same constant velocity so the momentum is not changing and then option c e k is equal to a half m v squared the mass remains the same the velocity remains the same so the kinetic energy is not changing so we know that our answer is d but let's see why that is true uh the potential energy ep is equal to the mass multiplied by gravity multiplied by height the mass is the same it, it's not changing the gravity is the same but then the height is changing because our hot air balloon is going down so uh the quantity that is changing here is potential energy right 1.6 so the answer to 1.5 is uh is d it's d then 1.6 a liner standing at a uh, roadside records the frequency of sound waves produced by a siren of an ambulance the ambulance is moving at a constant velocity along a straight horizontal road the frequency time graph for the detected sound is shown below which one of the following statements concerning the motion of the ambulance is correct so at this point here it seems like the ambulance is moving away right and then at this point here the ambulance is moving towards yeah assuming that the frequency emitted is the same the learner is still stationary and then it is only the ambulance that is moving relative to the learner right why am i saying that this is away this is away because the frequency when an ambulance is moving away will be less than the frequency when the ambulance is moving towards right it's not rocket science it's Doppler effect <laughs> yeah so yeah um it seems like the ambulance it starts off moving away and then decides to turn at some point and move towards the liner right because when it is moving away we have less frequency and then when it is moving towards we have a higher frequency we experience a higher frequency right so option a approaches the liner and then passes the liner if that was the case our graph should look like this right and then we actually have the opposite b moves away from the learner then turns and approaches the line that makes sense if it is moving away we're gonna have less frequency and then if it decides to turn and move towards the learner or approaches the learner then we're gonna have a higher frequency so 1.6 b and then c says approaches the learner then turns and moves away from the learner that is not the case and then d moves away from the learner and then stops that is also not the case i want for 1.6 is b and then uh, 1.7 let's look at 1.7 another interesting one two identical charged spheres x and y carry charges of plus 2q and minus 6q respectively sphere x experiences an electrostatic force f to the right when the distance between their centers is r the spheres brought into contact and are then returned to their original position 
which one of the following represents the magnitude of the electrostatic force that sphere x experiences now so let's start with uh, f1 right uh, before they are brought together and all that this will be equals to k q1 q2 divided by r squared column slow right k is a constant and then what is q1 2 q and then y is 6 q right why am i not saying minus 6 q that is because for column slow we are only interested on in the magnitude of the charge right and then divided by r squared so this will be uh, q multiplied by 6 this will be 12 k q divided by r squared right and then f2 in f2 they are brought together and then separated what is going to happen when they're brought together and then separated so we're going to have q new the new charges the new charge on the spheres right uh, that will be q1 plus q2 divided by r squared right greater than 11 like so q1 we have 2q and then uh q2 we have minus 6q when you calculate in q new you actually have to put the sign in there and then divided by right so 2q plus uh, minus 6q that will be minus 4q right divided by 2 we have minus 2q right so now we can say that f2 will be equals to k q1 q2 divided by r squared so k is a constant q1 2q q2 we also have 2q divided by r squared so 2 multiplied by 2 that is 4 obviously k q divided by r squared so let me show you something uh f2 f1 is 12 k q divided by r squared and then f2 is 4 k q divided by r squared should be easy to see here through uh, just a bit of mathematical uh, manipulation that f2 is equals to 1 divided by 3 uh, f1 right because 1 divided by 3 of 12 kq divided by r squared will give us 4 kq divided by r squared so the answer here for 1.7 is uh, b is b right and then now uh, moving to 1.8 in the circuit diagram below r1 and r2 are identical resistors the battery has negligible internal resistance the power dissipated by r1 is p so r1 let's move to r1 real quick right the same that the power dissipated that is p which one of the following is the power dissipated by r2 so let's start by the power dissipated by r1 it will be equals to i squared multiplied by r and now let's go to the power dissipated by r2 right so here we have a current of i we have a current of i we have a current of i and then it divides here right r2 is equals to r3 so the current should divide equally right here we should have i divided by 2 and then on this part of the circuit also we should have i divided by 2 right so we know the current that r2 experiences so now we can say that p is equals to instead of i squared we're gonna have i divided by 2 squared multiplied by r so that will give you 1 divided by 4 i squared multiplied by r and then we know that i squared multiplied by r is p right so this will be 1 divided by 4 p right so the answer to 1.8 is actually a